Governments that ban books are typically not good governments. This is not a good thing. You're lucky to be in America. You're, you know, America is the envy of the world that, look, we got to appreciate our freedoms. We've got generations before that died so that you and I could enjoy these freedoms. We all want the same things, Matt. I don't care where you're from, what color you are, what's your religion. We all want the same thing. We want to live peacefully. We want to be able to raise our family, provide for our children. We, we, we still got to find a way to get along. We, we still got to find a way to work together. All of us have to embrace that civic duty and we have to really cultivate patriotic thoughts. You're going to get knocked down, stand up. You're going to get knocked down again, stand up. It's easy when it's easy, but you really see the measure of a person in how they process and handle failure and pressure and stress. Never short stopping, now I'm winning like I'm Jida. Steady through the rigor, yeah, I'm getting bigger. So my guest today is George Sorial, former chief compliance officer for Trump International, a former attorney and executive with uh, Donald Trump. And uh, we're re revisiting this conversation. We had a conversation pre-election uh, back at the Man of War conference hosted by Rafa Conde, and uh, we're revisiting the conversation today. So, uh, George, welcome back to the Seven Figure Squad. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. Um, and again, it's it seems like an entirely different world uh, from when we first spoke. It's amazing what a year and a half will do. It sure is. You know, when when you came out with your book, The Real Deal. I mean, you wanted to come out with stories so people can get to know, you know, at that time President Trump, you get to know him as a man. The stories that you put inside the book. Um, I mean, how I mean, how do you feel right now that that uh, it's, you said it's a completely different world, man? How, how are you feeling? How are how are things for you? I feel good. I mean, I I, I think again, you know, am I happy with some of the stuff that I'm seeing? You know, absolutely not. Uh, obviously, wasn't happy with the result of the election. It is what it is. That's ancient history. I kind of, you know, I'm kind of the type of guy that just I look forward. Uh, the past is done. But, you know, it's a disturbing. There's a lot of bad things going on. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just amazed every day when you wake up and you see the headlines. What are they canceling next? Uh, it's a sad state of affairs. But at the same time, you know, you have to be positive. You have to do what you can do. You have to fight every day. Uh, so think, things are good, Matt. I, I can't complain. Everything is, uh, is good. I'm healthy. My family's healthy. Um, working hard. Um, you know, that's what else can you ask for? Let's let's why don't we jump there. Let's let's talk about what what concerns you the most right now, George. What concerns you the most? Uh, what's what's at the top of your mind? You know that, that there's a lot of things that concern me, but I I I, I think what really bothers me the most, and people ask me that question all the time. And you know, I'm an immigrant, uh, like like many people in this country. Uh, I immigrated here when I was a little kid. Uh, I, I came here. My family, my my father had an education, but he had no money. Uh, like many people came here two years old. Um, you know, my father worked very hard and he's the embodiment, uh, along with my mother of the American dream. Sure. They raised me with this very simple mantra that you're lucky to be in America. You're, you know, America is the envy of the world. I mean, I'm originally my, my family, uh, we've got a mixed background, uh, partial European, but, uh, partially middle East. Uh, my, my father's a Christian from Egypt and I spent a lot of time in the middle East. And when I was there, they would always point out to me, say, see how things are here? You know, aren't you lucky you live in the United States? And that, that simple line, the U.S. is the envy of the world. I mean, that was kind of something that I, that was a mantra in my life. But what you see now, you have entire generations of kids that don't think that way. They think America is a bad place. They think America is a racist place. I mean, that term racism has almost become a war cry from the left. I mean, we saw yesterday, Dr. Seuss is a racist. Come on. Uh, I know. No, we, we, we've forgotten, Matt, we've forgotten our freedoms. We've forgotten how lucky we are to be living in this country. Is it a perfect country? No, no country is perfect. But I believe it's a great country. And the thing that bothers me the most is we've got these generations of people that don't feel that way. They're embarrassed. They're ashamed to be Americans. I don't know how that happened. So that's really, you know, out of all the negative stuff we see now, 
you know, that lack of patriotism, that lack of respect, that lack of a basic understanding that, look, we got to appreciate our freedoms. We've got generations before that died, okay, that died so that you and I could enjoy these freedoms. Um, that's what bothers me the most. You know, George, I was, I was uh, having a, a talk with a, a friend of mine. I said, you know, imagine if you, know, you take a page out of, the, uh, out of Israel when you graduate high school, when, when you take a page out of the Mormon culture. Imagine before you go to college, you as a 17, 18 year old, go serve for a couple of years, either in the military, some, some public service, you know, the Peace Corps. You know, Israel, you go right into the army. Right, uh, uh, Mormons, you're 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 shipped off to some place outside of your local area where you're in position of being uncomfortable to serve, obviously to to promote to the, the 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 Mormon faith. What type of uh, what do you think the ramification would that be if that was a social experiment? If we had our young kids graduating high school before they go to college, serve. I love it. Uh, I love it. And I, I think if there, there are those that are inclined to serve in the military, that's fine. We could also create like the Israelis do and like other countries do a type of civil service. But mm -hmm. I think in the end, it gets you to the same place. I mean, to instill some sort of patriotism, some sense of civic pride. Yeah. Uh, you can't have a country where its own citizens aren't proud to live here. I mean, that's something now that's almost a unique American experience. And it really, it, it causes me great pain and distress. And again, there are men and women that laid down their lives over many generations so that you and I can live in a country that allows me to own a firearm, that you and I can live in a country that allows me to publicly go on TV and say whatever I want, criticize politicians. You try doing that in many parts of the world and see what happens. And that's something that I always say, you know, you guys, you, you guys try, try to stand out publicly and criticize the president in probably 80% of the countries on earth, and you're not gonna do too well. No, zero, yeah. Matter of fact, that reminds me of something. I, uh, I got friends of mine, I, where's, where's your CD? Uh, uh, fellow, fellow veterans of mine are now musicians, and um, they came out with a song called The Patriot. The I love Patriot. it. And uh, they are black men, but yet conservatives. Right. And, and their mantra is like, if I am black, why do I automatically by default have to vote or lean liberal or Democrat? I want to think you know, on my own. And it came out with a song called The Patriot. Would yeah. you believe, um, remember the, the day of the riots in, 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 in the, uh, the, cap, uh, the, uh, the United, United, the state, uh, United States of America Capitol, the Capitol building. Yep. They performed a mile away and their song here not only got, they were number one on Billboard. And because they had some, you know, the same presence of them being in the same area, they, the, 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 the technology companies pulled their songs from Spotify. They pulled their songs off. They canceled them. Yeah. So, so what are your thoughts about the current cancel culture? I mean, I, I think it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, I, I, I think we've all become, you know, first of all, something that I was thinking about a couple of days ago when they started with all this nonsense about banning, you know, this handful of Dr. Seuss books, you know, looking back historically, governments that ban books are typically not good governments. Okay. This is not a good thing. Okay. Now, you know, again, I'm not suggesting that we haven't evolved as a society. Okay. And I will certainly acknowledge that 50 years ago, 60 years ago, or whenever people were different, it was acceptable to say things that some people would find offensive today. But that doesn't mean that you go and completely erase the past. The past is a part of you. And I think, you know, when it comes to something like Dr. Seuss, I mean, I, I just, I don't even get that. That's just a ridiculous example. But, you know, I think people have gone too far. People are too sensitive. But one thing I'll say is I have a lot of optimism, Matt, and, and I think you'll understand this. I mean, I, I the, the way I'm wired, I, I always try to look at the good. I mean, you can dwell on the bad and negative thoughts and, you know, go crazy in your head and that doesn't help. But I am optimistic that although we differ, okay, it's okay to differ on the political spectrum. There's nothing wrong with that. I can be friends with people that have difference of opinions politically. But I, I think 
95% of this population, even those that differ politically, are like you and I, and they're looking at what's going on and saying, wait a minute, this is not what I signed up for. This is not cool. This is not what I wanted. So they're having their moment in the spotlight right now. And I, I think when the light shines down on them and, you know, we can see in the open what a lot of those that represent these movements, you know, who they really are, I think the country is going to reject it. So I think maybe we're going through this crazy moment to get to a better place. Uh, but I think we all need to stand up and fight now. And this is the time that, you know, people's voices need to be heard. Yep. Uh, you know, I'm not suggesting, you know, anything, you know, unlawful or violent. I mean, not at all. That type of behavior in this country is not acceptable, period. But, you know, Matt, now's the time to stand up and take a stand. Uh, they want to ban, uh, you know, a book in the school. Stand up and, and, and take issue with it and say, no, we're not going to accept this. You know, if you don't do that, then the reality that you fear is going to become reality. Yeah. You know, the, uh, the uh, invitation I received right after uh, Biden came in, I'm part of the AAPI initiative, the Asian American Pacific Islander initiative, where we were invited to the White House. And I got invited to the Zoom, the Zoom White House gathering to celebrate, you know, the, you know, Kamala Harris. And she was a, she was a guest. Wow. She was a, great. And I had to register for this thing. And uh, not the suffix, but, you know, the, the, I had to fill out, okay, so Matt Zappala, then I, it was either Mr., Mrs., and there's this long drop menu about what I was supposed to be called, my, I guess, my salutation, like Z, Yi, V, you know, like, what is, that? What is this? Yeah, you know, Matt, it, it's funny. These are the same people that keep telling you to, you know, listen to the scientists. Listen to the scientists. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think science would dictate that there's, you know, there's two genders, but, you know, it's just such insanity. But again, I don't think that this is America. And I actually, I admire you for, you know, look, I didn't vote for Biden. I'm not a fan of Biden or Harris, but in my heart, I hope they're, I hope they're a great team. I hope Biden, we look back in four years and say, this guy was the greatest president. I don't think that's going to happen, but I'm an American. I want this country to be successful. Therefore, I have to respect my president and hope that that president succeeds. Prove me wrong. I have no problem with standing corrected in four years and saying, ah, Biden was pretty good. I don't think it's going to happen, yep. <laughs> but I think we have, to, we have to think like that. What was going through your mind on election night? Like around eight o'clock, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock? when the, uh, vote, the, the voter registration spots in those specific states we're talking about started shutting down and are saying, we'll just count it in the morning. Right. You know, I, was, was there something going through your head? Like, uh oh, what's going on here? You know, it, it was a strange, um, you know, I, I, I was very confident and I, I, I believed in my heart that, you know, President Trump would be reelected. And obviously, election day for somebody like me was a little different from many other people. Um, I'm, I'm just closer to it. Uh, but I went to sleep, I don't know, 1130 or so, 12 o'clock. Things were looking pretty good. I said to myself, I, I'm, you know, president's going to get reelected again. And then, you know, what happened happened. Um, you know, look, I, I don't I'm not endorsing any conspiracy theories, uh, but there are certain things that I have a hard time believing. Uh, for the life of me, I can't understand why simple things show up, vote, produce an ID. I don't see the problem with that. I don't see how that's suppression. Yeah. You know, you can't enter a building in Manhattan nowadays without an ID, never mind getting on an airplane. I mean, there's so many things that require proper identification. You would think that the system would favor that to make people feel secure. Now, I'll acknowledge this year was a strange year. We had COVID and, you know, we're dealing with, with, with things that are unprecedented. But my humble opinion, when you have this whole voting by mail system, you're just inviting trouble. Yep. Uh, and I, I, I think, again, I'm not going to, you know, comment on, sure. you know, what a lot of people would talk about. But in my simple mind, there are certain things that I have a hard time accepting. Uh, and I think anybody says that there was no evidence of fraud or irregularities. That's really not true. 
so I think, again, rather than go through what happened, we need to look forward. And the focus should be, how do we make this more secure? Because right now, you got half the country that thinks that the election was stolen. And that's a problem. You know, that's a problem on any side. And I would say that's the same thing if had Trump got elected, if half the country thought that it was stolen, that's a problem as well. People need to be secure about voting. I mean, I, I can't recall in my lifetime when anybody had any doubts about the results. So there's a problem. And I don't see the left, the Democrats, trying to remedy that. And I think that's an even bigger problem. I think I just saw on Twitter right now that they're uh, looking to eliminate voter ID and increase uh, a mail-in uh, of uh, voting ballots. So I, I don't understand. Is it really? I, I don't. I don't get it, man. I I I just don't get it. Um, like when, you know. when, when I go to the airport and it's I either go to the, the normal TSA or I can go to TSA pre-check or yep. now I can go to clear. Right. And I prefer the clear because I can look at the thing. It, it senses my iris. It, it, it ident- I don't even have to pull out an ID. It, it reads my iris. My picture pops up. I scan my boarding pass. I mean, what an efficient way to, to get on, 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 on the airport. Matt, we have the ability now. You know, we yes. have the ability to do these things and we have the ability now to create, cre- you know, secure systems. But the, the crazy thing is, if, you know, I'm sure that people are going to see this and I say, look, we need to make things more secure. Somebody's going to scream and say, you're a racist. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty hard to call me a racist. I've got, you know, family on two different continents. Yep. Um, so I, 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 I don't understand why our government wouldn't want to button down this issue and make things more secure. When we're looking at your former boss, right? Yeah, uh, the, the former president of the United States. He goes through a sec. You and I, when we had a conversation, he went through the first impeachment. Now we were visiting our conversation here. You went through a second impeachment and beat that too as well. As a lawyer, was it constitutional for a private citizen at that time to go in front of another impeachment process? I think the whole thing, you know, people can debate back and forth the legality of it. Uh, but I think rather than even go there, let's just look at the practical aspect. And I think it was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, he had lost the election. He had been, you know, he left office, you know, enough is enough. But I, I, I think, again, they overplayed their hand. And I, I think the American public is smarter than they give people, than they, they, they give us credit for. People saw what happened with that second impeachment and said, you guys got nothing better to do than mm-hmm. continue to torture Trump. Yeah. Um, it's ridiculous. And I, I think you will see the result of that in 2022. I have every confidence and I think they even know it. The house is going to go back. The Senate's going to go back. Oh. And if we continue down this path, the, 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 the president's uh, presidency will go back too. So again, that kind of ties into what I was saying that, I don't know. Maybe we need to go through this period of darkness to get to a better place. Uh, who's your front runners um, for the Republican ticket coming up in 2024? What do you, what do you, who do you think is a who do you think is going to take that spot to be the Republican candidate? I don't know. I mean, obviously, you know, you ask me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Trump guy. I'd love to see him run again. And I, I think there's probably 75 million people uh, that <laughs> say the same thing. And I, I, I think you saw what happened over the weekend at CPAC. I mean, You know, he's the undisputed leader of the party, period. Um, So, you know, there's great optimism about that. But I I think there's a lot of, you know, rising stars. Um, I like Christy Nome. Uh, I like people like Tom Cotton. Um, You know, there's a lot of really good Republicans that are rising in the ranks. And I I, I think, again, the key the, the key for continued Republican success is to really build out the party. And I I think if you look at things like what happened in 2020, when you look at the Hispanic community, the African-American community, there was unprecedented levels of Republican voting. And for the first time, maybe since Reagan, the party expanded. And I I think they'll continue to do that. And I, 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 you know, when we were just chatting earlier, you know, people are a lot smarter. And I I think that old assumption that the Democrats had that they're going to you know, flood the country, uh, flood the market with handouts and certain groups will come. 
I don't think that's true anymore. And I think people are wising up to that. And, you know, look, I, I give me a job. I don't want a handout. I want a job. That's a really simple philosophy. And I think that's, I think that applies to 99.9% .9 of the people who are getting public assistance. They want to work. That's just, you know, that's what people want. We all want the same things, Matt. I don't care where you're from, what color you are, what's your religion. We all want the same thing. We want to live peacefully. We want to be able to raise our family, provide for our children. Um, you know, that that's what people want. You know, George, you're, we're, we're thinking about, um, you know, we're thinking about our, you know, our move to as well, because I live in I live in Illinois. But what, what I'm thinking about uh, your state with DeSantis running that state, I'm also thinking about what Disney just did. I think Disney is shutting 60 stores across right. America, local retail stores to sell the Disney products. They're shutting those down to be able to sell their physical products online. And I saw what they did last year, increasing Disney Plus to compete with Netflix. But then I also see Disney Corporation, and you have a Democratic state, California. They shut down Disneyland. Theme parks are closed. But in Florida, DeSantis said, hey, keep them open. Disney World is open. So you have the same company, same corporation, two different political environments. And the one that's thriving is the one that's it's 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 you know the 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 red state. I mean, what what are your thoughts about you know? And and then on top of that, Democrats are leaving Democratic states, and where are they going? <laughs> they're going to the uh, they're going to Republican states. Yeah, that that's a big concern of uh, myself as an ex New Yorker that left. Yes, uh, you know, now living in Florida. Um, you know, look, I, I, I think if you want to talk about New York and California, um, you know, things aren't working out too well for Cuomo right now. Yeah. Uh, and things aren't working out very well for, you so, know, for, for Governor Newsom either. Uh, I think he's about to be recalled. Uh, both states, people are leaving in droves, which means they're not happy. They see no futures for themselves or their family. So their methods have failed. OK, I think we can say that unequivocally, that is not an opinion. They have failed. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I, I don't understand how, you know, it's a big concern for Texas and Floridians. Uh, you know, these people bring their voting habits with them. I don't understand that. I have no explanation for it. Um, you know, but again, I, I, I think even if you want to talk about it in the context of COVID, you know, Florida's numbers are just as equally good as California. And, you know, Florida has been open for business for a long time. I mean, people are cautious. Um, you know, I, I don't like living in a nanny state. Point out the negatives to me. I, I have confidence in my fellow man. People will act responsibly. You know, we don't need to be policed and scared and told to go into our homes and nobody can leave and we can't work, you know, uh, have businesses. I mean, it's crazy. We're living in a country now where, you know, you can go and loot a store and nobody gives a damn. There's no consequences, but God forbid you open up a business, you know, to try to support your family in a state where you have these ridiculous lockdowns and, you know, you're going to go to jail, you got federal agents uh, banging down your doors. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. There, there, there's, there's, there's a tension. There's a lot of conflict right now. Uh, things are coming to a head, but again, I believe that this is a small portion of the country. Okay. That are concentrated in certain places on the coast and maybe in Chicago. Uh, most of the country is just not like that, Matt. Uh, they're, they're like you and I, and again, they may be on different, you know, spectrums politically, yep. but they want the same things out of life. You know, speaking of the COVID situation, you know, uh, a lot of people are starting to realize they can do their business from anywhere, you right. know, and you've got, I mean, I think it was at Golden Sachs. I'm looking to move down to, but Miami, a yep. bunch of, a bunch of these large, uh, hedge fund equity, uh, uh equity managers. But billions of billions of dollars under the management are moving into Florida. And uh, uh, is this potentially the, the, the future potential breakup of the financial capital of the world, which is New York? I mean, are, are now people coming all over, even though they might be trading through Wall Street, but they can still access it through the Internet and still get things done in Florida or wherever? 
I think I, you know, I, I think it's too early, you know, to, uh, you, you know, say New York City is dead on arrival. But you know what? It's certainly looking that way. Um, you know, I, I, I think, and I love New York. I mean, I, I lived uh, 21 years uh, in Manhattan. I, in my heart, I consider myself a New Yorker, and I, I love the place. But it's a different place now, Matt. I mean, these, these guys between Cuomo. Uh, and de Blasio and their respective staffs, they've, they've destroyed the city. They've, they've obliterated it. Uh, they've, they've driven out their citizens. They've driven out their tax bases. Uh, you know, I don't even know. It's not the America I even know. So I think things have to change. You know, there's going to be some sort of breaking point or collapse, um, you know, if things don't change. And you may very well find that places like Florida and Texas are now, you know, the dominant um, business centers for the United States and the world. What do you think that Texas and Florida have done political wise to recruit businesses to come, come down oh, here, come but, and set up shop here. What do you think they've done right? What do you think they've done right? I mean, I think first and foremost, you know, taxes, I, I, I think they've got great fiscal policies. Uh, they've got, governors that understand growth, and they've got governors that respect the basic principles that the United States was built on. Mm. I love that I live in Florida and that I can carry a firearm. I think that's a great thing. It's not a problem. Responsible people with firearms in the streets are a good thing. And I am so happy that I live in a country where the government trusts me with that right. And I, I, I think that you know, between having great fiscal policies, uh, a respect for the basic principles that the United States was built on. And, you know, look, I, I think in the case of Florida, nice beaches and the weather never hurts. Sure. Uh, but, you know, there's a different there's a different spirit down here. There's a, there's an American spirit. There's a respect for what it means to be an American. There's a respect for patriotism. I mean, these are basic things that I think President Trump really recognized and appreciated and pointed out. I mean, I don't understand, you know, the simple America first. Some people find that, con you know, some people find that to be, oh, that's controversial. But wouldn't you expect that your president wants to keep your country first? I'm not saying we should mistreat other countries, but what's wrong with America first? And I can say that. I'm an immigrant. I've got direct family, you know, in Egypt and the United Kingdom. And I would still say, first and foremost, I'm an America. I live here. This is my country. America first. Yeah, George, it's like saying I'm a provider, but I need to take care of everybody else first before taking care of me first because you can't give what you ain't got. Right. That's right. Same premise here to America. I mean, uh, you know, less than 100 days uh, of the Biden presidency, we're back to bomb in Syria. That's right. I mean, that, that's it's interesting that you put that you, you pointed that out. Uh, everything nobody ever would have expected the peace that came to the Middle East. I mean, look what happened when when, you know, let's go back when Trump came into office. I mean, I can remember President Obama's uh, kind of parting words to him were your biggest problem is North Korea. You know, you can remember missiles were flying that got diffused. And yep. then the Middle East, ISIS was running wild. All that calmed down. All that ended. We had the Abraham Accord, which nobody ever expected. Oh, Again, you know, I, I, I've got Middle Eastern roots. I, I, I understand this, but the Middle Eastern landscape is a completely different place. And yeah. we're five, six weeks into it and bombs are flying and tensions are raging again. Uh, they don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it was profound for me even to see that, uh, you know, as a, as a veteran that fought overseas, but just to see what happened when they all came together there in the White House lawn, just to see them all in one spot together. I'm like, what is going on? Is this for real? You know, yeah. but, uh, uh, you know it's uh, I, again, I have great optimism and, you know, I'm still wishing that the Biden administration do well. Maybe they'll get it right. Maybe they'll have some kind of an epiphany. We yep. know that these things happen. Uh, you know, at the same time, I'm a realist. Yep. But you know, something's got to change. Something's got to change. I, I think we're really, Matt, we, we are at a breaking point where some of the stuff that's getting rammed down our throat, you know, I don't endorse or support anything that happened on January 6th. Uh, I was actually very quick to come out and publicly condemn it. 
Uh, and as much as I dislike some of those members of Congress, uh, I don't want to see members of Congress hiding in their office. I don't care what, you know, yeah. how extreme they are. You know, even the worst progressive, that's not America. That's not what we're all about. But that type of anger is a symptom of, you know, what we're seeing. People are fed up. So I, I think something is going to change. You know, you know, back to the whole cancel culture or I don't agree with you type moniker. You know, if one thing, if one thing the military taught us is that no matter what the color of your skin is, where you come from, the city and neighborhood you come in, the, the socioeconomic upbringing that you had, we, we, we still got to find a way to get along. We, we still yeah. got to find a way to work together. And when, when I'm thinking about the, you know, I, I remember seeing a lot of Prager U type um, videos where they're just on campus asking why they feel they, what they feel about, uh, the, you know, the, the, the Democratic Party being, being liberal, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then the liberal students are calling the cops on them and saying, yeah, we have somebody here from Prager U terrorizing us. The cops get over there. They're like, they're not terrorizing. They just have a different opinion. It's called freedom of speech. Yeah. Well, you can't do anything about it. No, it's called freedom of speech. The cops are telling this kid, don't call us. I guess if he's physically terrorizing you, but he just has a different opinion. That's not terrorizing you. So how can we have, so if if, the, if there's a liberal out now that's upset of watching this video, how can we have a better dialogue amongst different, different thoughts? Well, I think it's funny. You know, it used to be, you know, if you go back to the sixties, you know, it was people on the left that held themselves out as free speech and come and say whatever you want. And, you know, it was kind of the right was the side that was seen as kind of being, you know, less cool and stifling open conversation. And I think we've completely flipped it <laughs> where, you know, God forbid you say something that doesn't fit into the left wing agenda. The first thing they're going to do is scream racism. Okay, that's become their war cry. You're a racist. And that's a really damaging, harsh word. You know, just that accusation, if somebody publicly comes out and says, you're a racist, okay, there may be no truth to it, but it's, you know, like, you, you, you know, the label is damaging. Uh, and then you're constantly on the back pedal. So I, I, you know, I don't know how we got here, but it, it's strange now that the left has really become you know, the side of the spectrum. These are the people that are banning books. These are people that are shouting down the opposition. These are the people that stifle anybody that doesn't fit their narrative. And they don't even recognize that, look, I could just disagree with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you do that, they're quick to label you. Yep. Uh, and they make up all these terms. I don't even want to get into them now, but they talk about these things. They make up these, these concepts and these words, and they talk about them like they're, like they're fact, but in actuality, uh, most of them are nonsensical. But again, Matt, I'm going to say it again. It's repetitive. I don't believe that the overwhelming majority of the country is buying into this stuff. So I think what people need to do now is stand up and say, look, I disagree. You know, somebody's banning a book, confront them. I don't agree with this. If something is being taught to your children, if your children are being taught in public schools that America is a racist country and America is a bad country, an oppressive country, call that out. Yeah. No country in the world has done more to address these issues. Now, I'm not you know, I'm not disingenuous. I'm not suggesting that racism doesn't exist. Of course it exists. And we should always strive to make things better and eradicate it. But I don't believe that, that, that America is a racist country. I don't want my kids being taught that this is an evil society and this is an evil country. So I think we all in our own little lives have to stand up and oppose this. If somebody's going to say to you, I'm going to take away your, you know, assault weapons. I mean, every time I hear, you know, what's an assault weapon, I, I, you see some imbecile standing on Capitol Hill, you know, they don't know the difference between a water pistol and an AR-15. <laughs> um, when people start doing that stuff, you got to call them out. You got to stand up and confront them in a respectful way. You got to vote against these people and you have to speak out. 
Because if you're just a sheep going along with the flock, saying yep. nothing, guess what? They're going to win. Yep. George, would you say to somebody's, would you suggest if somebody's just watching this and they may be an entrepreneur, they just graduated college, they just they have a new career, how what's what's the first steps? Would you suggest they take to get more involved in a political process? Is it look well, Democrats, I, 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 Republicans? What would they do? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of things you could do. I mean, politics is a really broad subject. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people, you know, look, they they're not able to go to Washington and participate. You know, at that level, they don't have to. Local politics and what's going on in your community is what really affects what you see what you hear and how you live. Okay. It's your, you know, your local officials, your municipal officials, they're really the ones, their decisions are going to directly impact every aspect of your life. So it's local. People need to get involved. People need to educate themselves. Uh, people need to participate in the process. And I, I think I give a lot of credit to President Trump. I think everybody has to acknowledge that Whatever you think about him, wherever you are politically, you may disagree with him politically, but you got to give him credit. He got the country up and engaged. People watched the news. People got into the process. And again, even if you disagree with him, you got involved. And I, I, I think that's what we all need to do. And again, I'll use that term. It's civic responsibility. Okay. People need to get involved and people need to lend a hand where they can. Again, I'm a firm believer in the community. You know, do what you can to give back. If your neighbor is in need, extend a hand and help. It's the right thing to do. It'll make you feel good. It'll come back to you. So it's just simple things like that. You don't have to participate or get involved at a very complex high level. You can if you want, but every person, every person can vote. Every person can be informed. Every person can show up at a school district meeting. Every person can show up at a municipal meeting every now and again, voice an opinion, be heard, send an email, send a letter. Everybody needs to get involved. This is our country. We, we all live here. Yep. Uh, and there, there's room for everyone. We can differ. Yep. Uh, uh, but we can't let one side completely tramps, you know, trample the other. And that's what I see going on here right now. Yep. Yep. hundred uh, percent. You, you, know, you know, was it Plato that said that quote, to not get involved somehow in politics? You know, not, not say that you got to be a politician. But not to get involved or understand politics would be then one day saying I'm being ruled by my inferiors. I completely agree with that. And, you know, again, I, I, I think if you look at our history, there was a lot of bloodshed, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of hard work to get to where we are. OK, you see what's going on at the southern border. Everybody wants to get into this country. People still flock to come to the United States. I still believe we're the envy of the world. And I, I, I think all of us have to embrace that civic duty and we have to really cultivate patriotic thoughts. And again, are we perfect? No, we're not perfect. We'll never be perfect. You know, you always improve. I, I mean, it's a humble thing for me. And I, I think you'd say the same, Matt. Uh, you know, you realize as you get older and older how really little you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's a humbling thing. You know, you start out as a young person, you think you're an expert, you know it all. But, you know, as you kind of go through life and you take in experiences, you start to realize, like, you know, I don't really know much. I'm, I'm constantly learning. Um, yeah. You know, we, we, we have to embrace and get back to basic roots, help each other out. You know, don't view your next door neighbor who's a Democrat as the other side or the enemy. You know, we can have fierce dialogue and debate. But we can still respect our country and fight to make it better. Hundred um, percent. Before I transition to you know your 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 former boss, you know, question about your former boss here. Um, uh, by the way, if you guys haven't picked this up yet, the real deal, get it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, or locally. I uh, I, I've, I asked you this in our first conversation because the conversation you, you brought up racism, and, and everybody thinks you know Trump's a racist, racist, racist. <clears throat> Then there's a conversation about being elitist. I mean, in your opinion, what's the difference between being a racist and being an elitist? I worked with him as a lawyer before I joined the organization for four or five years. 
Then I spent 14 years as executive vice president and counsel, then EVP and chief compliance counsel. I built things all over the world. I worked very closely with him. Look at me, Matt. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm living proof that he's not a racist and it infuriates me. You know, there, there are certain things that really set me off. You know, one of them is to insinuate that he's a racist. Uh, he's not. That's a joke. Anybody that knows him or works closely with the company knows that's the furthest thing from the truth. You know, people will also say, oh, he doesn't like to work. There was no guy that worked harder in the company. And I, I think you'd hear that not just from me, uh, but from anybody who worked there. Uh, but I think that whole racist thing is absolutely ridiculous. Um, you, know, you know, again, I'm living proof that the guy's not a racist. When people are elitist, I mean, you've been around wealthy people. You've been around, you know, some of the top 1% of the 1%. What does it mean to be an elitist? I, you know, I don't even know. I, I, I kind of think a lot of these left-wing lunatics are elitists. Uh, you know, their their way or the highway. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, I don't even understand what that term is, and it really doesn't apply to Trump. I mean, look, does he have the trappings of a wealthy, successful person? Yes, he does. But again, anybody that has ever met him or spoken to him or worked with him, and I, I tried really hard to tell some of these stories in my book. He's a pretty regular person uh, who thinks like us. You know, his day is not that different. Uh, again, you know, he he has an airplane and, you know, he has the trappings of success. But in his thinking, in his speech, in how he treats people, you know, I always would enjoy the first time people met him. Um, so I would say, hey, what do you think? And it was the same thing, Matt, over and over again. Man, I, I was really... I was surprised at how down to earth he was. I was surprised at how easy he was to talk to. You know, he looked me right in the eye. Uh, you know, he's kind of a regular guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I use that term. It's, it's kind of a weird thing to say he's a regular guy. But I, I, th I think, you know, you, what I, you know, hey, what yeah. I mean by that. Uh, and he wasn't a wallflower either. I mean, he, he got his hands dirty. He worked alongside everybody. Um, you know, he was a tough guy. How, how would, uh, if I'm working for Trump, Right. How would he how would he go about testing you to see if you are somebody that he should be employed for a while? I mean, I you know, it, it was the, the, the organization. It wasn't really a big uh, place. It was a really you know tightly knit group of people. A small family business. That you're sitting your first interview. Yeah. yeah and there's, there was really there's no way, you know, it, it was a meritocracy. You succeeded or you failed. I mean, there was no you were given an assignment. You got it done or you didn't. And there was no you know, if, if you failed, you knew about it. Uh, but at the same time, you were rewarded uh, with you with with success. So there was really no, you know, you were measured by your ability to get things done, uh, get things that he wanted done. I mean, it was his company, it was his family's company. Um, you know, so you know, it's not the same analogy. But I was I was a big chain of command guy in the business world. I mean, I, I took the instruction, I followed the order. Uh, and I, I either got it done or I failed. I mean, there was no, it was that black and white. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't know about tests. I mean, I, I, I could only tell you the common themes in the organization. Uh, people really like what they were doing. I, I think that's generally important in life. You know, uh, he always used to say, if you don't like what you're doing, you're never going to really be good at it. And I, I really agreed with that. And I, I kind of embraced that philosophy. Um, irrespective of what your chosen career or profession is, you have to like it. You know, you spend a lot of time working. You know, if you don't like what you're doing, you're going to be miserable and that's going to reflect itself in performance. Um, so I, I think love of job was one thing. And then, you know, basic things like trust, okay. loyalty. Uh, those were really, you, you know, very palpable themes at the organization uh, we all trusted each other and we were all loyal to each other. And I, I, I think combining that with exciting things and, you know, an environment where people really were happy to be there. I mean, I, 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 my focus was really on the development side, although I would do legal things from time to time. It changed a little when he got elected, but I really liked what I was doing. I mean, I like to come to work. I like to go see my projects in Europe. I really enjoyed the people I work with. So I was happy. I mean, if you're, you're, you spend 11, 12 hours a day, you know, in, 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 at your, your place of business, sometimes more, you know, you're not going to be a happy camper if yeah. you're not into it. 
How, how did, you know, be, being a small family, tight knit business, where you are looking for quality in your relationships there. How did Trump and how did, how did Trump International go about recruiting and developing their team? You know, there were, everybody had a different, uh, you know, way of, of getting in. It was a lot of, you know, somebody knew somebody, the organization would be looking for, you know, a person with a certain skill set. And, you know, somebody like me might say, well, I know the right person. Uh, you know, I, I, I personally, I, I think I told my story uh, last time. It's also in the book. I mean, I, I met him on the other side of a, a transaction and I just introduced himself because just coincidentally, his mom and my mom. Uh, were born in the same town uh, on the northwest coast of Scotland, a little island called Lewis, and that kind of caused us to click. But you know, it wasn't you know it wasn't like a, like a large public public company where you know there was recruiters, and I mean it was kind of a a word of mouth. I mean, obviously some people were brought in by traditional methods, but there were a lot of people like me that you know he had encounter had encountered along a journey. And there was something that clicked and, you know, one day he got the call and, Hey, why don't you come and work for me? I've got, you know, this project. And, you know, he was really good about my background. I was a corporate lawyer uh, for many, many years. Uh, I started out in government. Um, you know, I, I did some prosecution work for a little while, but I really spent 12, 13 years uh, doing transactional work in law firms. I became a partner. I didn't know anything about real estate development. I knew nothing about building golf courses. His thing with me was, hey, I got a piece of land in Scotland. You're the guy. Your mom's from Scotland. I know you don't know anything about real estate, you know, but I like you. I trust you. You know what I want. So I'm going to teach you and it's going to be great. Uh, and there were a lot of people like that. And he had an amazing ability to just pluck people from one area and have them apply their skill sets to a completely different area. And I, I think that's another thing that, you know, when younger people, you know, ask, you got to have an open mind and you have to have confidence that, you know, I have the ability to do many things. And if an interesting opportunity presents itself, run into it, you'll figure it out. A lot of skill sets are transferable. You know, substantive knowledge will come. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, I hope that answers your question. Oh, yeah. About, uh, yeah, there, there's, an article, there's an article right here. I'll, we'll slice it in. But there's an article here in Harvard Business Review about re-engineering the recruitment process. And it says, if you're unwilling to upgrade your skills, I think he even says about, you know, he's he even stated about 10 skill sets or just 10 skills in general. If you're unable to or unwilling to upgrade your skills at all times, you'll be phased out in 18 months. That's right. It's a different world. Things evolve quickly. Uh, I, I think rather than fear it, you know, look, change is just the natural reaction for a human. You know, change causes fear, but I, I, I think you kind of, kind of rework yourself yeah. and embrace the change, view it as a challenge, and rise to that challenge. You know, that's how you win in life. You know, you wake up in the morning and you know you embrace the new day. Uh, you get up, you feel good, you stretch, you exercise a little bit, you get yourself ready, you get out with a positive attitude and you see good. I mean, look, there's bad around us everywhere, yep. uh, but you got to focus on good things and you have to embrace change and you have to rise the challenge. That's what makes people win. It's not having a degree from Harvard or you know, having all these credentials. It's just having that positive mental attitude and having some faith in yourself. You know, you can do it. You can do it. You know, we live in a country where you can do it. George, what, what stuck out to you as uh, Trump being a very good deal maker and negotiator? Simple, you know, easy question. He once told me, it's a story I tell all the time. You know, we're, we finished up a rough day in a construction site and uh, the two of us were just, you know, kind of taking a walk and, just out of nowhere, he said, uh, you know, George, people always ask me, how did I succeed? How did I do well? He said, it's really, really easy. He said, I just know what people want and I give it to them. I look around, I see what people want and I give it to them. It's that easy. Now, you know, that's kind of an easy way of breaking it down. And, you know, how did he get that? I mean, A, he was a very observant person and contrary to anything that you hear 
Uh, he was always surveying people for their opinions and constantly asking, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think from people at all different levels? He didn't, you know, ultimately he made up his own mind, but he was a voracious reader. Uh, I mean, you know, we used to fly overseas and he'd bring a big box of magazines ranging from the Harvard Business, you know, reviewed, you know, all the way down to people. But he would read this stuff and, you know, that's how he learned. He learned about what was going on. He learned about what people liked. And, you know, that really resonated, you know, strongly with me. And it's something that I teach, you know, I've got young kids, uh, you know, I teach my son and my daughter that don't go through life blind, look around, see what people like, you know, be observant, um, you know, situational awareness, notice your surroundings, like go through, be an active participant in your life, you know, don't go through things blind and dead. And I, I, I think, again, that simple, I know what people want and I give it to them. Uh, it's funny. We live in a world, uh, Matt, you know, I don't know, maybe you see it with some of the people you work with. I'm amazed at how pe so many people don't listen. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. One, two, three, four, five. And then they come back and they've given you seven, eight, nine, and 10. And you're like, you didn't even listen. You right. know, if you're not listening, if you don't know what you're charged to do, you're not going to do well. So that simple thing, like, listen, be aware of your surroundings, be an active participant in your life. It's going to serve you well. If there's one thing about, I mean, if you care to comment on this, if there's one thing about one thing that Trump could have potentially done differently, because I know he, once he wins, he likes to remind you of it, right? He wins, he'll remind you of it. He wins, he'll remind you of it. And for a lot of people, when they keep losing, they keep hearing about how they lost, how they lost, how they lost. I think that may have not only created more enemies out of the current enemy, but it recruited other enemies for the enemies. Right. Um, you know, about this is this is my my observation. What do I know? But it, there, you know, I'm, I remember Charlie Kirk. Uh, he went down to Mar-a-Lago a, a few weeks. I was listening to his podcast. He said, you know, you know, uh, President Trump and I, we got together, we had a conversation, stuff that stuff we talked privately. But you know, there's certain words and nomenclatures he could have relabeled differently that if he was going to go back out again and and say, and I saw him do that at the CPAC convention right there in your, in your, in your state, he was rephrasing a little things, a little, which is a little bit more palatable for a lot of people to understand. I mean, was there, was there something that if, if president Trump could have said differently, uh, there would have been a lot more well-received, uh, during his presidency. I think sometimes, um, you know, he, he, he wasn't, he was a very empathetic person. But I think often that empathy was not expressed. Okay. And again, you know, people like myself and others that are closer to them, you know, we know what's inside. Uh, I, I think if I were, you know, to offer any, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, uh, not advice or criticism, but, you know, a comment, sometimes showing a little empathy goes a long way. Okay. If somebody's coming to, you know, to cry on your shoulder, it's not so much, hey, I'm going to provide some insight. Maybe that's not what they need at that moment. Sometimes the simple act of just listening and, hey, I hear you. I empathize with you. I'm sorry you're going through this. That's what's needed. And I, I, I think, you know, look, it's very easy in hindsight to reflect on things and pontificate about, well, they, they should have been done this way. That's really easy. Uh, you know, try making the decision in the heat of the moment. Not so easy. Yeah. But I think if I were to reflect back, you know, a little bit of empathy at times probably would have gone a long way. Um, you know, again, that, that's just my, my humble opinion. And I, I think it sounds like uh, that's probably what Charlie Kirk was alluding to as well. Sure. Now, now, you know, I'm just curious, too, George, you know, with you, your family, your children, I mean, the fact that you were able to work with this former president of the United States of America, right? I mean, what are some of the lessons you're teaching your kids? What are some of the lessons that you have your relationship with for a decade fighting battles and winning wars with Trump? And what, what's some of the, I know you got a lot of stories here, but is there things that, that you're telling your kids about, hey, you know, this is what this man did? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that I, I say to, you know, both of my, my, my children and, uh, you know, I, I, both of them are uh, very involved in martial arts, uh, although they're young, uh, three and seven, 
Um, both of them are, are very involved in the martial arts because I think it instills basic discipline. Uh, yeah. But that, that principle of never quit, okay? It's something that, I, you know, maybe it's one of the things why I clicked so well in the organization is my parents raised me with that mentality of, you're going to get knocked down, stand up. You're going to get knocked down again, stand up. You know, it's easy when it's easy. Okay, when things are smooth and simple, it's great. But you really see the measure of a person in how they process and handle failure and pressure and stress. So, you know, I, I think one of the things that I instill in them is, you know, you set a goal, never quit. You know, I, 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 you know, I, the younger, my, my three-year-old, I'm not really sure gets it yet, but <laughs> my, 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 my seven-year-old does. And I, I don't think a day goes by where I tell him, don't quit. You're going to get knocked down. Don't quit. Daddy fights to his last breath. That's all daddy knows. Love it. Daddy's not the smartest guy, but daddy fights. Daddy gets up when he's knocked down. Daddy keeps going. Daddy will be the guy fighting at his last breath. So I think things like that. And then I'm a firm believer. Um, I'm a person of faith. Uh, I'm an Orthodox Christian. I, I've got a strong foundation uh, in faith. And I, I think that can really provide some meaning in life. Uh, it can really provide comfort during very difficult times. It kind of, it's a humbling thing. You know, uh, life on this earth is, is temporary. There's more. Uh, you know, again, these are my personal opinions. And, you know, First and foremost, I tell my kids, just be happy, be happy, think positively, look at the good things in life, try to help people out. If your buddy is in need, if your buddy is down, lift them up to your level. You know, this is a society, we all take care of each other. So that's another thing that I, I, I constantly kind of preach to them, that concept of, you know, be a little bit altruistic. It's not all about you. Um you know, and, you know, basic stuff like work hard, um, you know, but these are, you know, these are basic principles, but some of them, believe it or not, are controversial now. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, and speaking of working hard, I mean, it, it goes without saying everybody knows that Trump got four hours of sleep a night, yeah. maybe at best five. But what, walk us, could you please walk us through a day of Trump first thing in the morning till maybe the last thing at night? What, what, what would that day in a life sure. Trump be like? Sure. I, I, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just give you a trip where, you know, give you an example of, uh, you know, we fly somewhere, you know, um, overnight. Uh, he liked to fly overnight so we could, you know, sleep on the plane and land and be fresh. Um, early morning breakfasts. I mean, it was typically, you know, up six o'clock, six thirty, you know, have breakfast, uh, and begin the day. And the days would be long. We would always take great breaks. Um, you know, some of my fondest memories of working in the organization was, you know, let's say we were overseas at a construction site, everybody would work really hard during the day, but at night there'd be these great dinners. You know, he'd take the whole team, you know, the whole development team, we'd take up half a restaurant. Um, you know, we're all out having a good time. And then, you know, maybe sometimes there'd be a little bit of work. I mean, it wasn't unusual. You know, I tell a story in the book where um, I was really late at night, 1130 or something like that. And we had a really long day. Uh, we were at Turnberry in Scotland and, you know, we kind of thought, look, the day's over. Uh, and I was with Eric, uh, Eric Trump. And we were just, you know, having a beer about to call in the night and who showed up? It's fine. Let's go guys. And he had a whole bunch of paintings because we had completely renovated the hotel and he'd bought all this artwork to hang in the lobby. And he said, let's just go do this now. So literally, I mean, that, that shows you, it tells you a lot about him. You know, that there was no task, there was no detail that was too small or beneath him. You know, he was there himself with his son and, you know, one of his executive vice presidents and lawyers hanging up paintings until two o'clock in the morning. Uh, so he worked very hard. You know, again, there was no nonsense. It was a results oriented place. It wasn't enough just, you know, to try. You had to succeed. Uh, but again, when you enjoy what you do and you like the people you work with and they treat you with respect, um, it's a great work environment. I mean, I, I, I really love the place and there, there's certain, I'm happy with, you know, where I am now. Uh, but I don't think a day goes by where I don't think about something that happened or, you know, I see something or I, I, I see something hanging on my wall that reminds me of, 
you know, the years I, I spent with that place and, uh, you know, I miss it. And I, I, you know, uh, I, I loved it there. Very cool. As a wrap up, George, you know, any, any Thanks, final man. words, now, our, our audiences are, as I watch as our YouTube channel, our first generation, they want to be first generation cash flow millionaires. They want right. to be financially free. They want to be the first generation to do it. The first one, kind of like your last name, you've changed around your last name forever because the decisions you've made, you've made a much better future for the Saudi Owls on down. Any, yeah. any, any final thoughts here uh, uh, to that audience that says, you know, if you want to do something special in your life, you're change your last name, just like Trump changed their family's last name too as well. I mean, he took his dad's last name from Fred to now him to Donald. I mean, now he's, he's elevated. He's raised the name of the Trump, the Trump name. Any thoughts, any comments to that regard in terms of making a name for yourself? You just got to do it, Matt. I mean, you did it. Uh, there's lots of people out there. You just got to do it. I mean, you, you, you know, we, 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 we don't live in a country. There, there are many places in the world where you're born into a situation and that's your situation done. Uh, that's not the case here. Uh, you just have to have faith in yourself. Uh, you know, again, I'm a firm believer of having faith in God and, and having basic principles, uh, be honest, be trustworthy, uh, have some integrity, show some loyalty and respect, work hard, and don't squander opportunity, and you will succeed. It's really not that hard. But George, thank you so much for your time. I mean, there's so many things we can all learn from you, your current, your current, uh, your current practice, reading your book, Here's the Real Deal. Um, I look forward to staying in contact with you. The next time I'm in, 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 uh, in, in your neck of the woods, I'll make sure I hit you up, and maybe we can have a beer. Thanks, more. man. I, I I look forward to that, and I uh, you know I learned from you. Um, I I learned learn from everybody, and uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk to you. And uh, I look forward to doing it again. Very good, George. Guys, if you've been watching this on Facebook, you're watching this on YouTube. Make sure you drop in the comment section below your questions, your thoughts, your comments, your follow ups. Drop it in the comment section below. If you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like and follow our business page, Money Smart Guy. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe and hit notifications to be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. We'll be dropping the links to George's work, his, his, his links, his, uh, his practice, his, his book here in the comment section. Also, make sure you check that out too. So that being said, on, on behalf of George Sodial, I'll be Money Smart Guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. Thanks, brother. Thank <laughs> you.